Hi, welcome to the AirGeeks blog. What is the spectrum under which arranging in music is enclosed? Before answering to that, let's pretend that you know nothing about it. A very direct way to introduce what arranging in music means to someone that doesn't know about the subject is how come this melody becomes possibly this? Or this? Or this. To which extent arranging involves proper musical knowledge? It depends. Giving a full shape to a given couple of melodies, for example, is already a start. The point in which composing and arranging are almost the same thing. Changing this or that chord, instrument or rhythm could be considered already properly arranging. Whatever we do to a rough composition with the intention of making it better equals arranging it. Arranging is taking decisions, so the amount of knowledge or elements that you have in order to make either poor or amazing decisions is, I think, crucial. But what does an arranger do exactly? There is a difference between arranging your own music and becoming a professional arranger. Arranging your own music involves mostly, not fully, but mostly achieving a balance between the need of working on your original composition and knowing what could be the best way of working it out. Becoming a professional arranger, on the other hand, implicates more than just spicing up an idea. It's not that there is an exclusive one and only list of things that you need to know to become an arranger, but here is an idea, an approach, a suggestion. Shaping, harmony, instrumentation, orchestration, technology, social skills. Giving a shape or a form to a piece of music is very important because it will make a song more or less satisfactory as the music runs through time. There is some sort of instinct, some kind of what your body is already asking or expecting to hear. Of course, the surprise element could be very substantial every time that it is well implanted. My advice is that you start listening from the beginning always, or at least from the previous section of the piece that you are trying to arrange. That amazing guitar solo is incredible. I recorded it after the first chorus, but perhaps its powerful nature could be amplified even more after the second chorus, or at the end of the song, or as an intro. Shaping is also giving the right length to a piece. You don't want people to get bored after a while. That by the way, it's more related to where you place different elements and not so much to how long a song is. This song Mama. is very long and it's amazing. As you already may know, any given note can be harmonized in a huge amount of ways. Chords are beautiful. They produce a feeling of augmentation. This feeling, however, could be distorted depending on the decisions you make. Harmony is an enormous subject matter, but I'd like to mention briefly just a couple of parameters where you could stand and from which eventually you can make good choices. Correlation and style. Again, chords make notes or phrases sound much more satisfactory, only you need not to fail at doing the right decisions. A big part of this will be determined by the knowledge that you have about the subject. If you don't know the basics, consider getting into it seriously, especially a jazz-oriented approach to harmony. Otherwise, chords will overwhelm you, like as if you were in front of a sea of uncountable elements that have no correlation or hierarchy between them. Understanding the functionality of harmony is like having some sort of map where you can see what roads are available. Of course, beautiness and satisfaction are both subjective, but at least you can distinguish that there are areas, neighborhoods, cities, and that you can take different roads to travel from one place to another. So you would not get lost as if you were blind in the middle of the desert without knowing where to go or how to get out of there. About the style, you can play a beautiful chord, isolated. It doesn't mean that in certain contexts, that same chord will not sound awful, discrepant or disruptive. Using the same location map metaphor, Imagine you start telling a story of you in Paris in a little cafe having a nice chat with a friend when suddenly and without any reason you appear in North Korea having a chat with Kim Jong-un. You can do that, of course, but it needs to be intentional and you need to go from one situation to the other one through a more or less correct way of traveling. Otherwise, your idea won't work smoothly, smoothly until your intention is for it not to run smooth. So be careful, this chord could be nice in this context.
but not so much in this other context. Instrumentation has to partially deal with the style also. If you start working as an arranger professionally, you have to be aware of the style of music that the person you are arranging for has asked you to work on. Try to be very clear about it. Is it pop, funk, classical, Middle Eastern, rock? And if it is rock, is it modern, 80s, 60s style? My arrangements are mostly oriented to acoustic performed instrumentation. If you are thinking of taking a similar path, my advice is that you don't stick to a particular instrument. Learn the basics of as many instruments as you can. The more instruments you record yourself, the more control you'll have over your arrangements. You don't need to master an instrument in order to use it for a particular production. Playing live gigs is a different thing. In music production, the focus is the sonic result, not if you are a virtuoso at all the instruments you use. If you are more into beats and more electro or virtual instruments, then subscribe to whatever site keeps you posted about the latest available VST. Right now, everything is so competitive that in a very short amount of time, the modern sound can change all of the sudden without you being aware of that. You cannot be behind your client in that regard. No one wants to deal with an arranger or beat maker that is not aware of what the modern sound is like nowadays. The reason why I am mentioning orchestration is because studying the subject brings you to the acquisition of the 3D factor in music. The families of instruments in a traditional Western orchestra are well defined. Each combination between families or individual instruments produces a particular resultant. The acknowledgement of this will help your brain to keep in mind that and then there is contrapoint. If you've never have studied contrapoint, then you're missing an extraordinary universe of possibilities. And this is not alien stuff. When you do a second melody to your chorus, not rhythmically parallel, I mean, you are already working some contrapoint. This could be brought to a high level of complexity for which understanding and or executing, again, you should have some knowledge Otherwise, you can produce involuntary disastrous results. Disastrous. For really getting into contrapoint, listen to Johann Sebastian Bach. As an arranger, you need to focus mostly on the recording part of the technology, unless you want to become also a mixer and mastering engineer, in which case I would advise the same thing as in the instrumentation section. Meaning, update all the time, research about what plugins and techniques the top engineers are using right now. If your task is only arranging, then it won't hurt to learn the basics of mixing and mastering, but that's not mandatory. What you absolutely need to know very well is your workstation. Whatever you use, Logic, Pro Tools, Cubase or wherever, become a master at it. Watch tutorials, get courses, put time into it. Everything needs to work fluently. You can't afford to be frustrated with technology if what you want and need is being able to produce ideas all the time using different setups, different instruments, in different styles of music. If you want to work as a professional arranger, you not only need experience and knowledge, but also social skills. You need to think it this way. Someone is leaving in your hands their wishes of crystallizing their emotions through a very nice piece of music. So you must work for that purpose, not for money. You will get paid, but that's not the point. You want this music to sound super great in the first place, which by the way, will lead you to get more work, which will make you get more money if that is what you want in the end. When you do a good job, your client experiences absolute happiness. It is an enormous satisfaction to listen to your song, an intimate and personal piece of music fully produced. And arrangement is, I'd say, the most important part of it. Be sincere with your clients. This is an intimate part of them and no one wants to be foolish. Try to understand what the composer wants and needs, but also share your thoughts about their expectations. Present to him or her more than one option to choose from. Clients adore that. Be in touch all the time. Communicate with them as they were your best friends. In fact, if someone is doing music, composing and writing lyrics for their songs, it means that you and him or her have plenty of things in common, which makes this person a great candidate for being your friend, perhaps even your best friends, who knows. Make their music sound so good that 
they would never have expected or imagined it would sound the way it does. If instead you've been commissioned a corporate gig or a commercial, an audio brand or something like that, then you need other type of social skills. Now you're part of a team. You need to understand that there is a chain of people that will interfere in your decisions and you need to be prepared for doing whatever is needed to be done. Even when that implies you doing something you don't agree with. And even when what you consider the best option, the one that you think is perfect, is not accepted. In this sort of environment, always be nice. Never get offended. Don't take things personal. A task needs to be completed. You've been called because someone considers that you can cope with this task. So you do the best of your best and be prepared for working against some track if it is needed. Even from zero, there is no space for personal feelings. I am not talking about emotions. Being able to produce emotions is precisely the thing that leads someone to hire you in the first place. There are many ways of promoting yourself as an arranger. I'm not an expert on that, but I can give you some few ideas, things that I've done that worked well for me when I started. Make a list of close people that you know they would like to hear themselves singing a well-recorded and produced song of their choice. Who doesn't love that? Arrange a track for them, make experience with them, start learning how to be intuitive with the desires of people. Once you have done that for free, start looking for singers that you can approach personally. Maybe your friends in Facebook, not necessarily people you know well, and tell them what you are up to. Offer to them an example for free. Take a little section of a song that they already have recorded, rearrange it and send them a few ideas. They will be glad to receive it. And if they like it, they will definitely have you in mind for their next project. Singers need arrangers. Once you have done some experience and you have some concrete examples to show, use a platform like Airgix to present yourself and offer your service as an arranger. Make a great profile, write a concise and friendly description of what you do, prepare a nice video, a good looking photo and share it everywhere. It won't be long until you get your first gig. From then on, the more experience you get arranging, the better you get at it. Thanks very much for watching this Airgix blog. Subscribe. Bye.